Uh, well, it's a question we're likely to uh, pitch many times in coming months. It's a very simple question, the question ultimately boiling down to EU in or out. Joining us now to discuss that, Raoul Raparel, who is co-director of the Open Europe Think Tank, campaigning for EU reform, uh, and Liz Bilney, chief executive of Leave.EU. That's a campaign group which is backed by UKIP. Good morning to both of you. Raoul, if we can start with you, regular contrib contributor on this programme as you are, uh, give us your, your pithy pitch for reform and staying in? Well, I think it's a great opportunity for reform. Um, this is the first time in almost 40 years that a lot of European leaders are owning up to the fact that Europe needs to change. It's gone through a number of crises. Uh, we don't know how that reform is going to go yet and how that change is going to happen, but I think there's time to give it uh, to play out and see how it goes. And I think a lot of people are prejudging this process on both sides. I think we need to wait and see what Cameron gets and how the reform package goes before anyone makes any decisions. OK, Liz, your opening salvo. We've got months of this to come. Make it a good one. OK, I will try my best. Um, it's interesting the, the comments just made there because obviously we have heard the first pitch of the reforms and they do sound pretty weak. So we want to be strong. We want to get our country back. We want to take control of our laws. We want to take control of our trade and our finances. And we can do that independently on our own. We're not part of, um, you know, we're not part of anything. We, we're an island and... We, we can do really well just by coming out and we will have a better opportunity. So we want to paint the vision and show people what it can be like. Yeah. Roll, roll, roll. It's interesting that so much of the debate, and you know, obviously the, the debate's very much in its infancy at the moment, but you suspect so much of the debate will focus on the economics, the business case, etc. And two very opposing views of the world begin to emerge. Uh, those who say, actually, we can do very well outside of the European Union. We can have bilateral trade agreements with the Chinese, look at how the Americans do, etc. And those, I suppose, like you, who say, actually, look, it would be folly and madness to leave the European Union. Yes, reforms are absolutely necessary, but we mustn't leave. Well, I, firstly, that's not what I'm saying. I, I don't think leaving would be the end of the world. I mean, Open Europe has done a comprehensive study and we found that the economic impact would be somewhere between a loss of 2.2% of GDP to a gain of 1.6%. I think what we have to say is that if you're going to leave, you face some tough choices outside. You have to be very open and very liberal. Uh, that includes open borders, probably, and being liberal to movement of people. Uh, and it includes a very strong deregulation drive and a strong trade liberalisation drive, which I don't know if everyone in the country is on board with. So I think people backing leave have to do it for the right reasons. I think we also have to realise that currently the EU and its free trade agreements cover 60% of the UK's trade. If the TTIP is signed and we get a free trade agreement with the US, that will be 85%. So do people really think an extra 15% is worth leaving for? It's a big question, but there are some hard questions both sides have to answer. Liz, I mean, I, I know you'll say actually we can do very well outside of the EU, but some people you talk to say, you know what, I'd, I'd rather be a bit poorer if it meant a bit more sovereignty. Is that, is that a widely shared view in your movement, do you think, that people are prepared to accept the risk, at least in the short term, that we might all be a little bit poorer if it means that we have an independent UK? We won't be poorer. Um, at the moment, we're putting in £350 million per week. That's the bill we have to pay to be part of the EU. If we come out, we, we don't have to pay that anymore. So we we will be better off by a £1,000 per person. That's real money in people's pockets that they'll be getting back. So to start with, you know, we will not be poorer. We will be stronger in every sense of the word. We'll be able to trade more. We'll be able to take back control of our laws. And we'll be able to take back control of our finances. We will be better off. Roel, I, I know you're not here, Roel, to, to speak for the Stronger in Britain campaign. They're, we're about to see the launch of their campaign in Brick Lane in East London very shortly. But... Comment on this observation that we've got Lord Rose fronting up the, the in campaign, if you like, a, a very prominent businessman. And there are some people who say, you know, actually, we're sick and tired of hearing business leaders say how brilliant the European Union is because, of course, th there's only upsides if you're a business leader. You get all that lovely cheap labour flowing over from Eastern Europe. You don't have to live with the downsides because you've got a lovely house in leafy suburbia some way from all the potential problems that things like mass migration introduce. So, therefore, give us a sense of whether you think it was that he's the right man for the job. 
Well, I think that's a, that's a very good question. And I think the inside has a number of challenges here. I mean, it's, it looks a lot like the same old people making the same old case as we heard, heard in the Euro debate 10, 15 years ago. Uh, they need to try and appeal to swing voters. At the moment, they're just appealing to their core votes, people who are already in. You know, I'm an undecided voter. I don't know how I'm going to vote. And the inside has not yet made any case that convinces me to say, OK, actually, you're right. I mean, I think there are a lot of people who are quite sceptical of the EU in this country, uh, but could see maybe the economic benefits would be worth staying in for but they need to make that more clearly and this idea that Will Straw pitched earlier on your program about an emotional case for Europe frankly that's just not going to cut it I mean people in this country aren't emotional in a positive way about the EU I think the positive case you have to make if you're the in campaign is reform Europe is changing this is a great opportunity uh, we can have to give it a chance to see how it goes push that reform if it doesn't work then you know we'll see but I think that is really the positive message they need not this idea that we have an emotional attachment to Europe because I just don't think the UK does. Interesting. Uh, Liz Bildy, the railway there was talking about swing voters. There was a poll published last week by uh, Vote Leave. Obviously, you know, as the name suggests, they want to pull out of the European Union. They were saying that the polls stack up a bit like this. A third of people want out and they will not be moved on the subject. A third want in, ditto, they feel pretty firm about that. But there's a third in the middle who truly have not made up their minds and you're reaching out to them. That, that's correct. Um, it's, it's really there all to play for at this stage. And part of our strategy is to tell people what it could be like to come out of the EU. Um, once people know and are armed with the facts, you know, we're here to dispel the myths and to present the facts. Because we know that when people are armed with that information, they will choose to leave the EU. It's a scary thing moving into the dark, which is why we want to tell people exactly what it will look like in terms of our trade, our finances, and taking control of our own laws and being able to deal with issues such as immigration, which we know we're struggling with at the moment. Um, but we can really, really do that by telling people and saying, here's what's what, here's the information for you to decide so at least everybody goes and when they have their vote, they are armed with the information to make their free choice. And we believe that will be to come out of the EU. Uh, Raoul, as Liz says, it, you know, it's scary. It's a scary option withdrawing. And you can be pretty sure tactically uh, the Remain camp, not least through the voices of ex-Prime Ministers, will say, actually, think very hard. This is a scary choice. They will use the scare tactic. Well, very much so. I think we're going to see a replay of the Project Fear that we saw in the Scottish referendum. You know, you're jumping into the unknown. And I think there is some, uh, you know, validity to that argument. You know, we've assess assessed all the options at Open Europe. If you look at the Norwegian model, it doesn't really suit the UK. You get access, but you also have to take probably free movement and you don't get a say over the number of laws. The Swiss model is very complicated. Again, you don't get full access for financial services and your influence is limited. So, I mean, there's no off the peg model that would work for the UK. And as it said that is a big challenge they have to explain what's being outside the EU means and at the moment they haven't really started on that I'm glad to hear that's what they're going to try and do uh, but I'm intrigued to see what model they come up with because through all our years of research over the past decade there is no clear model outside that works very well where you can combine influence access uh, and control of migration I mean those three things are very hard to get uh, a serious model in if people think the reform negotiation is hard that negotiation is even harder Mm. Liz, you probably couldn't see it, but our preamble to our debate was to show the two sides of the argument in terms of who's making the case. And if I could put it rather crudely, on, on, I know it's not Raoul's side, but on, on the Remain side of the argument, you know, you had business people, high-profile figures, no fewer than three former prime ministers. And in terms of the impact on public life, in terms of the calibre of the people on your side of the debate, I mean, you know, clearly some, uh, you know, very eminent people from the worlds of politics, but not quite, not quite up there with three former prime ministers. You need a big persuader, you need a big face, a big voice to sell this out message. Is it Boris Johnson? Well, we, we say this is the people's campaign. We are gathering support on a daily basis. We have already organized 700 groups across the country because it's the people that want to, to share their voice on this matter. So we will be led by, we already have Goddard Gonster, who are a great uh, campaigning sort of background um, company who will help support and guide what we're doing. But we will have a group of ambassadors supporting us. But those ambassadors will be real people. They won't be celebrity-focused who are endorsing 
um, a movement. They, they will truly be able to represent so we can identify as a, as a group of people that it is better to leave the EU. Um, those, those people will come on board um, make their case as, um, as the campaign progresses through. Mm. Um, but we do have big business leaders already backing us. Um, so I wouldn't say that we don't have the same support. OK. Raoul, final thought, really. And there's always a danger when you've got a referendum and the sitting government is arguing for one position because people think, OK, I'm going to slap the sitting government. Uh, and actually, that means voting in this instance to be out. So that's a possibility I'm sure you'll acknowledge. But there's another possibility, isn't there, that we do, uh, as I'm sure Liz, Bisney, Liz Bilney hopes for, we do vote out, just as they voted out, in, or at least no, in France and Ireland. And then guess what? There was a second referendum. Well, I think it's certainly a risk that it will be used to target the government, but I think we also have to give people credit. You know, if you look at Scotland, people voted on the issues, not just on uh, the prevailing economic or political situation at the time. I think people have engaged with the EU issue enough to vote on its uh, credibility rather than using it to hit out at the government. But that is always a risk in a referendum. In terms of another referendum, I don't know. I mean, there is a scenario where that could play out, but I think it would be very hard for people to override um, the case if if people voted to leave or stay in. The question is obviously here, what is the majority and what is the turnout? If you have a very run, close run um, referendum with a very low turnout, then is that really a mandate for such a big decision as leaving or staying in? And I think that would pose real challenges. And, and in any case, in that situation, the debate won't go away and it will come back very quickly. Yeah, and it would be a debate that would spark off moves in Scotland, you can be sure of that, uh, in a different direction. Raoul uh, Raparel and Liz Bilney, thanks both very much indeed. Jane. Thank you.